So hello and welcome to the 16th installment of Aaron Walker Art Talk. I'm Aaron Walker, and today I'm joined by Austin Batchelor, who is a visual arts instructor on Udemy and a practice advisor and content creator. Austin, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. So for the 16th episode, you have chosen uh, my painting, Garrett. Go ahead and explain why you chose that. Um, I thought I had good composition and good good color choice. And uh, from a technical aspect, I think it's one of your better ones as far as uh, the actual technicalities behind the painting. So I, I'm curious how there's multiple paintings named Garrett. And I'm and I'm looking at the Garrett 2014 one, but is are these all of the same person? Different people with the same name? Why? What's the story behind it? So uh, Garrett is a guy, one of my best friends, who I was living with for a while, and so uh, and I yeah, he has like an aesthetically pleasing face, very symmetrical. So he ended up being a subject like a number of times. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, he okay. it has a very. Uh, it's definitely like pleasing to look at how much of it is stylized and how much of this is like, this is actually what he looks like. Wait, can you repeat that? The stream yeah. Part? I was saying, yeah, he has a, it's very aesthetically pleasing. How much of it is stylization? How much of it is actually his face looks like that? <laughs> no, I mean like that's absolutely just what he looks like. Like wow. it's a realism. I think it's one of the more realistic ones and not quite as impressionistic, like not as many artistic liberties were taken, but uh, before well, I suppose first we should talk about like how the subject translates to the execution like of the piece. So I, I think in this, I was trying to go for like a sense of familiarity, right? And uh, kindness and softness, right? And so I think it goes through with the colors because the very soft tones and sort of very radiant tones, right? And so I suppose the question for you would be um, like, what is sort of your take when you were producing art on using color and composition to create uh something like a sense of familiarity right Mm -hmm. um well i think typically sorry excuse me you said that you were wanting to feel you know calm and and kind and stuff honestly that's not really what i get out of it i think it looks really intense because you have really really high contrast is there's very few like midtones. The background's the only midtone, and then the, his himself, the focal point, is really high, bright tones, and then really dark tones. So there's really high contrast. So when I'm when I'm painting, I typically use that to make something feel really intense or to really draw the viewer's eye to that location, which it does really well in this. Is it's obviously where we're supposed to look, right? Mm-hmm. Especially the face area where there's lots of subtle transitions between the between the tones. Um, but I, th- I don't know. I think it's pretty interesting because typically um, I know. So I noticed that I was looking at it pretty closely. There's some very slight warm hues in his face, right? But they're really subtle. And then the shadows are a lot cooler in the background is cool color. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, is interesting choice, especially considering like what you said you were trying to go for. Because typically you'd use warm colors to to indicate like feelings of like calm or kindness and stuff like that, right? Lots of oranges, yellows, reds that make people feel like comfortable and safe. Mm-hmm. You use a lot of cool colors that make it feel kind of like cold, almost surreal, or um, even like otherworldly, even possibly like divine. You know? Okay. Um, but the really subtle warm hues in his face, I think are what make it relatable and still feel like, like a person instead of like an alien or something or like bizarre, you know, it feels like that's, that's a guy that I could talk to, you know, right. I'm curious, like how was that the decision from the beginning? Or is that something that as you went, you're like, you know, this is feeling way too cool. I need to add in some warm tones. So it feels like he, you know, has some warmth to him, some life to him. How did you make the decision to add that in there in a so painting say, that's dominantly when say, cool? When you say the warm tones, I assume, and I wish I had a better picture of this. The only, because of course, after I made this, I gave it to him. So I don't have uh-huh. any HD pictures, but um, I assume the warm tones are like the pink in the face. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, that's about the only color in there. But I mean, like, I agree about 
if there were no warm tones, it would be inhuman. It would be completely pale. And you would think that this guy was like a ghost or something. Right. It would still be a person, but it would feel way more abstract or at least uh, impressionistic. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But uh, not, uh, so I think, mm, I can't claim like the artistic, like, no, I did this consciously because I thought that there wasn't enough cool or what have you. It was more just like instinctual, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, what well, really, works turns out nicely. Oh, well, thank you. The only really like conscious, like truly conscious uh, use of color in here would be like the background relating to the eyes, right? Mm-hmm. And that your eyes, I think, are, are, you are drawn to the eyes of this in part because of this blue background, right? Right. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I'm curious. So on his chin and stuff, is that beard or that's shadows? Beard. Okay. So at first I thought it was a shadow, but I can see now how I can see how it's a beard. Um, it's that little soul patch, I guess. What you're right. Talking. Yeah. Cool. But yeah. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask if you had any more questions. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, so the other ones that are named Gara, are they also the same person then? Yes, sir. And what... Because I probably wouldn't be able to tell that. They look completely different, like in style-wise, mm-hmm. right? So what was... Was it just for the heck of it? Was there like... Uh, it's part of like a series that means something more like what was the decision in painting this one. And cause as, as I was looking through other paintings, most of them are not done in this style. Mm-hmm. This one seems to kind of stand alone in the way it was done. What was the decision behind that? Well, this is just one of my earlier paintings. And so this sort of style, I think um, it isn't entirely unique, like in my portfolio, there's like a small period where I did these. I mean, this is a pretty, I wish I had it with me. This is a pretty small painting, um, which sort of limits what I can do in terms of strokes, right? Um, I typically work with large canvases because it gives me more um, flexibility and that sort of thing. But as far as I know, I only have two things called Garrett. And so it's this painting and then an illustration, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this painting was done immediately after I stopped living with that dude. And then the sketch is one I did like when he was right in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it wasn't a part of a series, but it's just like coincidental. Well, not necessarily coincidental, but that it's circumstantial, right? That in these right. circumstances, he was portrayed in different ways. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. So the other one is, looks like it's an ink drawing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Cool. So what, um, I guess like for you and your art, what is like the purpose behind it? Like, is it production based? Is it expression based? Is it, you know, like, why are you making it? What's the goal? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, that depends on the piece. So, I mean, like, and some, sometimes, um, and I've said this in previous episodes, you know, I will look at a face on the internet, the reference picture, and be like, you're beautiful, I must paint you. Uh, It's sort of that sort of manic, stereotypical, like artistic process. Um, Other times there's like symbolic weight to an image, like, and I've mentioned this also in previous episodes, but it's like, I saw this image of like a hawk standing over a a dove that it had just like totally murdered. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I saw that one. And so, like, that's a sort of image that I think is full of symbolic weight. And so, in that instance, it's that sort of symbolic weight that impels me to, you know, portray it on canvas. Um, but in general, I'm not sure what you mean. If it's production-based or... Mm. What was the other one? Uh, I guess, like, inspiration or expressive, like, wanting to express yourself. Right. So, I mean, I suppose it just depends on the piece. Um, and I do occasionally very occasionally get commissions but Mm -hmm. i typically can most artists i meet break down into one or two categories is like production artists and then there's uh like fine artists kind of Mm -hmm. and fine artists are basically people who they 
they're painting for a living, right? Like they're painting to sell their paintings in like a gallery type setting. And then a production artist is someone who is like a concept artist or a comic book artist or illustrator who they, they're painting something with a specific, really specific job in mind, right? It's not just for the expression of it, but to, you know, illustrate a specific idea or, uh, you know, come up with a design for a movie or whatever. And, uh, that's, so that's what I meant by prediction. Like, like, was it for, you know, do you typically paint for, you know, editorial stuff for magazines or, you know, or is it just for your own expression was right. kind of the. So like, um, it's something that's something that I've become more aware of as I've started selling my art. So I didn't start until like, uh, two years ago, let's say mm -hmm. up until that point, I had just been painting and illustrating and what have you for myself. Um, and then I would occasionally land in galleries, but it was just a matter of, you know, I made this, why shouldn't people see it? Right. Um, but then I found myself with this huge, like back catalog of work. And I was like, well, I can probably like make something off of this. Right. And I started going to art markets and what have you. And then very recently made set up this online store and started the series. Mm -hmm. Um, but before I started selling my art, I never really thought about, well, would someone want to buy this and what would be the impetus for them to want to buy it? So like creating something that what is, what's the stereotypical example that somebody would want to hang above their couch. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is something in art history that artists have to deal with. I think I can't remember who it was, but it might've been Dolly. Um, that someone came to him and said, Hey, I want you to make this because, uh, make it red because it will match my red couch. And he was like, so offended. <laughs> he like, just didn't talk to the guy again. Um, I don't know what's your take on that. I think there's a, there's been a really interesting paradigm shift in, in fine art because at least in my experience, I I'll go to, I'm a production artist, like 100%, right? Like this piece behind me, I did this piece um, digitally and then I had it printed on canvas and blown up. And, uh, and a lot of people are like, ooh, that's a really nice wall art. But when I made it, it was 100, it was marketing art. It was to market one of my courses and stuff, 100%. And I did all of that very, like, you know, really contrasty colors and like really well-defined shapes that were really going to grab people's attention, you know, and stuff like that, and visceral imagery. Um, and when, it, but when I get invited to like fine art stuff, you know, like I have a, bu a buddy who's, who has his stuff in galleries all over the state and stuff. And he'll invite me to these art critiques with a bunch of fine artists where everyone will bring work that they're currently working on and get feedback from other artists, you know, and, you know, critique it. And what I've noticed personally is that it seems like if you go back a ways in history that the fine artists, right? The people who are doing, you know, paintings for galleries and stuff like that were obsessed with their craft, right? Like they were masters of what they were doing. They trained hours and hours and hours with the masters, studying the masters, you know, like they, each stroke was decisive, right? And on the flip side, production artists and design artists, it was much more like the art doesn't matter nearly as much as getting the idea out. You know what I mean? Like as yeah. long as you can understand what it is, it's good enough, right? Like I don't need to make a masterpiece. Yeah. I just need you to kind of understand. And it seems like that's almost flipped because a lot of the fine artists, when I go to these critiques, if you critique their stuff, they're not just like, oh, thanks, good point. They're like, they come up with like a billion excuses for why their painting looks bad. And how it's just like, well, it's just like an expression, you know, like, it's just, it's just like kind of how I feel about it, you know, or like, I just want it to be that way. And you're like, okay, well, the composition looks really bad. And the contrast <laughs> is terrible. You can't even see what it is like, and they're, but they, but they just justify it as like, well, that's how I like, I felt and I want to express it. You awesome. Know? Listen, you don't understand. I was going for dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much what they say is like, it was supposed to look bad. Right. And and to me, it just like blows my mind. Like, it's like, well, if you're a fine artist, like you should be a mass, like you should do everything intentionally, but to kind of just act like it's art. It's kind of, I can just kind of feel it and, you know, put stuff up there. And now the production artists are way more how the old artists used to be where they're like, everything needs to be perfect and you can't like, everything needs to have a purpose and it needs to, when people view it, it needs to make them feel a certain way and like mm. think something about it, you know? So I don't know. I think, uh, 
as far as like Salvador Dali goes, the, those artist types where they're just like so prim, you know, and, and pompous, I think they're killing their own market. Like, like they're because they're not selling to other artists like hardly ever, right? Mm. They're selling to consumers, right? And if you're I selling mean, to, I maybe. Think, well, I think that this is kind of like going into what art is, and mm-hmm. like especially in art history. So like, who who painted the Sistine Chapel? That was Michelangelo, I believe. Yes, I'm right? trying to think I, because in the series I bring up Michelangelo, Raphael, like just mm-hmm. masters, and so. So to some extent, yeah. So he was commissioned to paint the Sistine Chapel. But right. like when you ask what was he doing, he didn't make it for the people who were like running the Sistine Chapel. It was for posterity, right? Like right. creating art for all future generations for, for history. Right. Um, and so I think there's that, mm-hmm. right? And then there's like the capitalist artist who is creating art for a consumer. Right. And then and there's there, just the like postmodern artist who's just making art for themselves. Totally idiosyncratic. Right. right. And, and those people who are making it for themselves, like that's fine. You can make it for yourself. Like there's nothing wrong with that. But then they then kill their own market by treating anybody who doesn't agree with them or who has preferences that are different than theirs as complete, you know, classless swine, like a buffoon, you know, like there's so, <laughs> they're so arrogant that it's like, why would anybody ever want to talk to you or buy anything? Like you're a total douchebag, you know. <laughs> but in your, in Salvador Dali, it actually it does make sense because even today, even among production artists, there's kind of two. If if you're a potential client looking for art, you kind of have two ways to go about it. You either know exactly what you want, and you're just finding someone who can recreate exactly what you have in your head on paper, which is kind of a little bit of a lower skill set, or you don't know quite what you want, but instead you have a specific person in mind who you admire their creativity and what they can come up with and you want them to create something because you yourself aren't a creative person right and for salvador dali he wasn't really much the first type right like he's not basically a human printer you know like there's some artists and that's and there's nothing wrong with it but there's some artists and that's what their profession is is basically taking other people's ideas that they've already created and just kind of visualizing them for them. And then there's other artists mm-hmm. who come up with the ideas, you know what I mean? And right. Salvador Dali was the type of guy who came up with an idea. So right. someone coming to him and being like, Hey, I want to pay you money to make art, but use my idea instead of yours. It's kind of like, well, then why the hell are you paying me to make art for you? Mm-hmm. My job is to create, you know? Right. So I can see that as being like, that makes sense. But as opposed to some of the postmodern people who are just so like, like it doesn't matter if it looks good. It doesn't matter if you don't understand it. Or like if you if you don't like this, then it must be because you're just stupid lower class buffoon. It's just like, dude, maybe you just suck at painting. Okay, why don't you go shut up? You know, it's just ridiculous. I painted a toilet gold and I put it in art gallery. Like I really deserve. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Austin, I think that that I like this has to be cut off at some point. I think that's about good for this episode. Um, thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next episode. Okay, sounds good.